Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 4 o'clock rock here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Wednesdays at 4 every single Wednesday. We love this show. It's our flagship show on energy. And guess what? Uh, we have Jeff Ono, co-host. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jay. Nice to have you here. And we got some VIPs between us. We got Mark Glick, and he's a senior strategy policy person, mm -hmm. specialist person at HNEI, um, used to be the chief energy officer for the state. Uh, and he can talk about, ooh, all the science and the research and all the things to follow the future of energy in Hawaii. And we have Daryl Young. Uh, he is the, mm, uh, wait, 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 number two guy. Dep yep. Number two guy at the Department of Transportation right. under Ford Fujigami. That yes. is something. We have him here at this table. We are so excited to have you here, you guys. Thank you for coming Come down. On, thank yeah. you for having us. So this is a this is discussion of fueling transportation in Hawaii, and I'm I'm going to let Jeff scope that out for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Jay. Well, during the month of April, we've been talking about the role of hydrocarbons in this clean energy future, mm -hmm. and we've got bills in the legislature that are pending uh, to make 100 percent alternate fuels for the transportation industry. So we want to talk a little bit about you know, the harbors, and are we ready to import all these type of alter alternate fuels? So, Mark and Daryl? Well, okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, we have about uh, five linear miles of uh, pier space in Honolulu. Um, where does that go from? Where to where? From uh, just outside, uh, what was it called? Um, right along uh, Kaka'ako, from that side all the way around uh, through Aloha Tower, uh, past the domestic fishing village, through Young Brothers, around Kapalama Container uh, Terminal, uh, through Sand Island, and around toward Kehi. Very important space. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the space is all taken at this point. So one of the things that, that concerns us as we start to talk about alternate fuels, which we're very supportive of, is the need for storage and distribution uh, and how that's going to be handled. Uh, our primary uh, harbor for... Um, fuels is Kalailoa out on the west side. Uh, we have just two fueling positions right now uh, and we are working uh, through a master plan and EIS to build a dedicated fuel pier. Uh, my biggest fear is we're going to build the fuel pier based upon petroleum and we're not going to have that alternate fuel uh, capability to be put in at the at the onset so there's going to be a cost uh, thereafter whoever may come to bring the, the alternate fuel. Again, we're fully supportive. Um, on that side, we have a few areas of bulk land available if someone was looking at it. Um, but again, we, we, we need someone to come and approach us on whatever ideas that they have. And again, we could be ahead of the technology at this point. But, you know, still trying to figure out the logistical. Well, putting it in, in context, there's yeah. a bill pending in the legislature right now. The Blue Planet Foundation is yeah. organizing a, a rally or yeah. something at the, at the Capitol Rotunda yes. tomorrow. They want 700 students to come down and, uh, and, and support this bill. Right. And the bill is to make transportation uh, fossil-free, 100% right. um, renewable energy, I guess. Uh, by 2045 to match right. the electrical generation uh, bill that, that was passed two years ago. Sure. Um, and that's not so easy, is no, it? No, it's not, it's not that easy. The, the question becomes, what type of fuel are you bringing in? Is it fungible? Is it compatible with petroleum products that we have now? Is it going to be a blend into what we have, or is it going to be a completely different fuel? And if it is a completely different fuel, what is the storage capacities? Uh, oh, capabilities, the, the, the characteristics of it. Um, does it harden after it reaches room temperature? Do you have to heat it as it moves? Do you have to chill it as it moves? Those are all the questions that we, we're needing to know as we start to plan ahead for that infrastructure that needs to be put in. Yeah. Now, Mark, you, you, you're a planner. <laughs> <laughs> What's the plan? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the transportation sec sector uses twice as much energy as the, mm -hmm. as the power sector. So mm -hmm. I think the first thing we have to do is put into context that we're talking about a big deal. We're talking about uh, really the lion's share of energy, two-thirds of it in the state is, is dealing with transportation. We have to come up with, I think, more uh, comprehensive plans that involve more community players. And... We also need to do something that is done extremely well in Europe and even better in Asia, which is to look at 30-year, 40-year planning windows. Mm -hmm. 
and get everyone together and look at the multitude of, of uh, transportation, multi-use sort of uh, uh, mass transit options, and then also look at basically rebuilding our traffic lanes with bike lanes and with, uh, you know, it's all connected. oriented design. It's all connected. All this stuff is connected. But yeah, but which takes a long time. But, but not only the fuel. It's the funding of the roads that's tied to the fuel. That's right. As you get away from the petroleum products, as you get away from what we call the gas tax or gas fees, what is going to replace it so that the miles traveled uh, funds the roads that need to be built? Um, when the fuel tax was, was originally put in, it was based upon nine miles a gallon, uh, you know, the types of cars that they had back then. As, fuel, as cars became more efficient, you're not bringing in as much revenue as you need to keep up with the demand that people have for new roads, bigger roads, uh, bigger road systems. So how does that how does that funding mechanism tie into the alternate fuel that you're bringing in as well? As you get away from petroleum products, what you're going to end up with is you're not going to have enough money to pay for your highways. Well, and, and the difficulty, yeah. and you know, Daryl talked about also the technology getting in, being in front of the technology okay. a bit. It's also in front of the future mm -hmm. of our, the way our urban areas look. Right, right. So, you know, when he talks about newer, improved roads, they may be fundamentally different when we have autonomous yeah. vehicles, when we have uh, more integrated oh, right. mass transit, yeah, right, when we right. have, you know, um, uh, more pedestrian-friendly uh, areas. So th those are long-term design issues, and we need, mm -hmm. as a community, and as a state, yes. to get together and plan that, and look how do, and ask ourselves, what do we want our communities to look like twenty years from now, thirty yeah. years from now? Yeah. We've never done that, I don't think. Right. It isn't going to be easy. I mean, you have a lot of people, a million people. You know, in generation, you have a couple of utilities. Right. We talked about this before, uh, but in uh, electrical generation, but in, in transportation, you have marine industry, not not many players, right. and and you have a million cars on the road right. and they all have investments in the infrastructure in the cars and in the ships and in engines right. and all that stuff right. and so <clears throat> if you want them to change it it's going to a it's going to cost them a lot of money b it's going to cost the state a lot of money right. and c how are you going to get people to actually um you know change their investments yeah. to other infrastructure that works with renewable energy this yeah. is going to be very hard it's going to meet political resistance right well you know fortunately uh Two of our larger carriers, uh, Matson and Patient, are, are buying new vessels that will be coming in in the year 2019, 2020. Uh, they're to meet the, the, the air mandates. Um, they're coming in dual fuel capable. And when I say dual fuel capable, they'll be able to run either LPG or LNG, depending on how they set it up, uh, from the West Coast. And they're probably going to fill it up so that on a normal sea, it'll, it'll be able to come to and from Hawaii. Uh, the, the reason it will be dual fuel capable is depending on whether or not they run into bad weather coming or going, they would probably need an, a, 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 a petroleum-based fuel just in case they just offshore and can't make it to the West Coast. You know what I mean? You, you, you need to kind of make sure. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is as you become dual fuel capable, depending on that type of fuel, you need a power plant on the – it's not just a, a tank. It's a power plant now. So you're converting the LNG – to a gas farm to the engine. So you're taking away cargo space. So again, you're, you, you could inadvertently raise the cost of goods by removing space on the vessel for the power plant. So Mark, <clears throat> let's, let's, make, let's, make yeah. you, <laughs> let's make you the guy in charge of everything. Okay. okay. And we have, what, 25 plus, what, two or three years, 20, 27, 28 years mm -hmm. to achieve this, if, assuming that bill passes which I think is a fair chance is going to pass because aspirational bills are easier mm. to pass than the ones that implement mm. the aspirations. Right, right. Okay, <clears throat> so what are, the, what are the basic, the fundamental boundaries of how we go forward? Where, where do we put the left foot, where do we put the right foot going forward, assuming this passes and assuming we need to get, we need to do what Dow's talking about within 25, 26, 27 years? Well, clear, clearly, and I have to give um, the Department of Transportation and Ford Fujigami and, of course, Daryl Young and, and his colleagues there a lot of kudos for be, being willing to take on energy in transportation for the first time mm -hmm. that I've, I'm aware of. Yeah. We, uh, we, I join with that, I think, and Jeff does too. And, and kudos I, to you guys. I genuinely mean that, and, and that's an important part because 
when I was the energy administrator and working with the consumer advocate and, and a number of people, you know, we tried to bring in some new players into the, into the game, but, you know, the state energy office is not the center of transportation. So you, you essentially have, in terms of the public facilities, uh, and of course, you know, the roadways and the harbors and the airports, you have the Department of Transportation, but then you have all of these other players. You have the field providers, you have the kind of people that, I know we're going to be talking about the Refinery Task Force uh, in the next part of the, the show, but uh, getting different players at the table than we dealt with when we made the pledge to go to 40% renewable portfolio standard and then 100% in the electricity sector. whole different set of players. And it's really assembling those people and in determining who is responsible for what parts of the change that needs to be made. And then look over the time horizon, who, you know, at the players, the integrated business systems, and then, and then figure out how these investments can be made and how they're going to make the companies that are involved in that whole as we go through this. So if you can't figure that out, this will go nowhere. Well, we will figure it out. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, you know, because as we, as we go toward renewable energy in both electricity and, and motor transportation, aren't we hastening the, the potential closures of, of our refineries? And, and if that happens, are we ready at the harbors to import mm. jet fuel? Um, can we take right. more jet fuel, you know, at, at so, Pier 51? Yeah. So one of the things, so jet fuel comes in at Pier 51 right now. Um, we are actually, when we're building the new Kapalama Container Terminal, one of the things that we made sure was we reached out with the Airlines Committee of Hawaii and the Hawaii Fleet Fueling Corporation to put in another line at Kapalama so that we have, as a state, uh, uh, redundancy in systems so that we have one, the two fueling points in case mm -hmm. one is, mm -hmm. is taken out of, uh, of, uh, out of service. The other thing that we, we're, we're doing is we're, we're hastening our ability to develop uh, Kalailoa. Uh, in the past, we would have done the traditional uh, bond float, uh, build the Kapalama container terminal, wait a few years, and then eventually get to uh, Kalailoa and the dedicated fuel pit. We're trying to do both at the same time. Uh, and it's that urgent for us to make sure we know um, what's going to happen out there. You, you brought up the fact that it could hasten the, the, the leaving of, uh, of one of the two refineries, if not both. Uh, you know, the sale to One Rock is, is one that we were watching, and we're trying to make sure that we have enough space right now uh, to take on if someone was bringing in finished product versus bringing in crude and, and then shipping it out. Um, Kalailo is a daylight-only port, uh, and, it's, and it's busy because we have cement ships, we have coal ships, we have all that. We're trying to free up those spots. Uh, when we build the dedicated fuel pair, we will keep the the two fueling positions as an alternate in five and six, so we actually have four fueling positions out that side. Uh, we believe it's that important for us. Yeah. But again, we would we would like any of these alternate fuel providers or suppliers or people who have ideas to start looking at what is what are you going to do to supply and distribute the entire state with these fuels. It's a fantastic question, an important right. question. It's going to take a, a lot of people together, you know, uh, a, new, a new group, if you will, right. as Mark says. But right now, we're going to take a short break. I'm going to switch you out. Okay. Right? <laughs> we're going to switch you out <laughs> well, for Joshua Rocky. Thank, you. thank you so much for okay. coming down. There'll be more. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> thank thank you, you so much. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Justine Spiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m. on ThemeTech, we host the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. We like to bring in folks from the whole realm of the local food supply and agriculture, anyone working on these issues, any organization or individual that has plans or projects. What kind of people have we had on? Uh, so we've had farmers, we've had chefs, we've had people from government, uh, larger institutions, everyone who's working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So you can see us every Thursday and join the conversation on Twitter, and we hope to see you there. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just 
energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Okay, we're back. We're live after a very refreshing break. Uh, here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Talk about fueling transportation in Hawaii. Jeff Ono, my co host, Watanabe Ng, attorney at law. Uh, and we, we had uh, Daryl Young from the Department of Transportation, uh, and he's off in Yan. And in, in his place, uh, Shasha Fesharaki uh, from FACTS, let's see, FACTS Global Energy. That is correct. Yeah, thank you for coming back. Thanks for having uh, me. And Mark Glick, thank you for staying, Mark, <laughs> <laughs> with H N E I. So, can you put this in context, Jeff? What, what does the discussion before have to do with the discussion now? <laughs> well, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to make this up as I go along. <laughs> well, you know, last week we had Dr. David Isaac from Facts Global uh, also talking uh, to us, and he started talking about the, the new uh, IMO regulation on, on sulfur, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we just had Daryl Young talk about the harbors, and I thought that was a good segue into Shasha to talk a little bit more about what, what this is going to mean for um, marine transportation mm -hmm. and, uh, and how that fits in with this, you know, hydrocarbons and clean energy. Sure, sure, no problem. Yeah, a few words about this uh, new IMO regulation. The IMO is International Monitor uh, Maritime. Maritime Organization, Monitory. Um, basically, they're responsible for all the regulations in the shipping sector. And they have this new regulation with regard to sulfur limits that it can only be 0.5% sulfur by 2020. Now, in Hawaii, we've been uh, complying with this and even lower levels uh, since 2015 at 0.1%. But why this matters a lot is now the rest of the world is moving to this new spec. So the price goes up. Well, I'm going to get to that, actually, yeah, yeah. Because it's a very fine line as far as the amount of fuel that is available to meet this spec. So if the refineries want to make this new spec, they have to give up valuable cracker feed space to this uh, other fuel, basically create this, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on the lower sulfur premium uh, fuels, such yeah. as what we use in Hawaii. Yeah. So our electricity prices are highly tied to this new regulation that is going to be pulling on the same limited fuel supply source that we draw, i.e. Hawaiian Electric, and our electricity prices are going to be uh, affected tremendously by this. How much? Because if you make that a is a question, we're, we're kind of modeling that right now, but That's what I, was I, I would think yeah. at least a 20% uplift from what the baseline would be. To us, 20% more. To us, more as for a and that means 20% more. For any electricity that is generated from yeah. low sulfur fuel oil, yeah. which is still about, I don't know, maybe 60%. Uh, almost 70% so. so with just LSFO then okay yeah, yeah so almost 70% so two-thirds of your electricity bill that's going down that is going down with the with the more fixed renewables but but nonetheless um, this is a really really big deal so people are looking at uh, installing alternative fuels such as LNG as we heard about um, Pasha and Matson um, doing that and maybe LPG but it's uh, it's kind of like a nuclear bomb in our industry so it, it's and it has deep repercussions for the state of Hawaii as well. Yeah. And well, it actually, it's good for alternative fuels, though, because now when the baseline goes up, yeah. right. suddenly. It's motivation. Exactly, exactly. What about the other part? Uh, you know, I, I mentioned that I'd heard recently that somebody said, you know, oil goes up, goes down. <laughs> it's not that simple. It's not that simple. <laughs> um, it, you know, in the context of where we've been uh, historically, we've actually seen not too much of a variation in the last couple of years. Um, you know, maybe $15, $20, which is still. You know, not insignificant, but maybe not the 40 or $50 movements we've had. That being said, over the next few years, we do expect limited variability in the prices, only because the marginal producer is now the United States, and it's not um, some governments in uh, certain parts of the world, i.e. the Gulf, that are really dictating the price. Um, that being said, it is a fungible, or it is a, a finite commodity, and eventually, you know, you're going to have pressure on the demand and the pressure on the supply, and the prices will begin to inch up. So that volatility, um, while it might be flattening out a bit, is certainly not going away. Yeah, yeah. So that considered, let me ask you one more question, then we'll mm -hmm. turn to Mark. It will solve everything. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Which area is going to be more affected by these, by these market changes that you have just described? Transportation or generation of electricity? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think uh, we've already seen the massive transformation of the generating sector with renewables, um, not just in Hawaii, but around the world. Um, so you've seen the cost of solar drop tremendously. So um, that being said, there is no silver bullet right now for transportation, as you guys were alluding to earlier in the discussion. And if I look around the world, I look at somewhere like Japan, very high tech, educated society, no natural resources, very similar to Hawaii. 
I mean, even they don't have ambitions yet to go to 100% uh, renewables. Now, maybe they're not being ambitious enough, but um, really, I think that there is a bit more, I don't know if realism is the right word, because basically they want to have a plan and then follow that accordingly. So the transportation sector is what I'm trying to say is much, much more difficult uh, to crack. But that is the key to solving your dependence on hydrocarbons, because as Mark alluded to, in most places in the world, transport accounts for two thirds, you know, if not more, yeah. of your total energy demand. Yeah, and that means the money we spend to bring it in, in this case. Exactly. And I want to say one more point, and that's that um, we model what the global car fleet is going to look like in 2040. And if you even look at what the EU has done, electric vehicles are definitely growing. But even at today's growth rates, they're not expected to be more than 10 to 20 percent of the global fleet. Hybrids could be another 20 percent. But then you still have, you know, 60 percent on uh, traditional gasoline and diesel vehicles. And that's because a lot of the incremental growth in the world, remember, we're looking at it from the West. It's all in Asia, and they're focusing on a completely different set of economics than we are out here. So, from a global how, how, just give us a word on oh, what I that. mean, they're, they're trying to get their middle class up, you know, to basically everyone kind of owning a car, and they're very focused on the cost aspect. So, um, the ability to pay more for, a, call it a, a feel-good factor, whatever you want to call it, it just doesn't exist in that part of the world, mm -hmm. you know. So, it's a, it's a different perspective they're coming at. Mark. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, so one of the things that I found uh, is, is a fascinating new statistic because, you know, when you really look at replacement schedules for things like, uh, you, when you're coming with alternatives to gasoline and diesel, you know, you're looking at maybe a new fuel system or, you know, uh, using electricity instead. And the truth of the matter is uh, somewhere, and it's much earlier than we intended, or we expected, uh, somewhere between 2020 and 2024, we'll actually finally re reach parity because of the you know, dropping cost of batteries mm. with a gasoline vehicle, diesel vehicle, and an electric vehicle. So that could lead to a more rapid replacement if the manufacturers this, start this producing. The production, because we, we model the production is not keeping up. That's right, and the yeah. production isn't keeping up. So the good news is that at least now there appears to be a cost model. Now, if these vehicle models that they've built or they're building begin to have really broad acceptance and the infrastructure grows, then you may see a more rapid uh, production to meet that. And that could help a lot. But that's still a small fraction of the overall picture. It really re requires these other things, d design of you know, other ways to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Yeah. You know, basically get off of the road. The social end of it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you need both of those. And what I just mentioned is the lion's share of it. Yeah, sure. But one, let me add one thing, though. You know, we, we heard last year about this time was at the Verge conference. Yeah. Uh, you you were running that essentially about graphene. I didn't know anything about graphene. Yeah. Graphene is a one, one layer of carbon atoms. And it, it holds a charge and can give up the charge very quickly. It, it could be the best battery we ever saw, much better than what we have now. But I heard recently there's another one, which goes beyond graphene, which is solid state batteries. Okay, and, and without you know comparing the technology, the fact is there are things in the pipeline yeah. that could change batteries for mm -hmm. cars. Mm -hmm. And th this kind of disruptive change is really out there. It's not that far away, I think. And, and the, the, the thought I would offer you is that when we find that solid state batteries are going to be available in car number A, B and C and D are all going to have to do it because the public will demand the best battery, no? Yeah. And, you know, at HNEI, uh, where I am now, um, we, there are test labs and uh, really some extraordinary uh, technicians that are working on uh, various chemistries, uh, thin films for PV and others, but on the, on the storage technologies, um, there are uh, really interesting processes. Right now, you know, you de decommission a battery in a vehicle when I guess it gets down to about 80%, uh, it, it still is functional at 80% of its original capacity. It's lost 20%, but it still can, for the next 10 or 15 or 20%, it could have enormous applications in assisting in uh, grid stability and, and other things. So yeah. basically these other sort of innovations as well, including you know, these you know, solid state batteries and, and other chemistries that will be astounding, 
along with just new strategies to be able to transfer and, and use, you know, better use the, the lives of, of batteries that are already in existence and to, you know, recycle them better. Yeah, and who knows? I hate to say this, Sasha, but who knows? Batteries could be used in marine transportation, too, couldn't yeah. they? Whoa. <laughs> well, it, it could be used in many different applications, this, you know, yeah. if they get to the kind of point that, um, that we were inferring earlier. Mm -hmm. so. Jeff, what do you got? What? Let me just see if I understand this right, Shasha. If, if oil prices are going to $70 a barrel, for mm -hmm. example, by 2020, mm -hmm. the, the IMO's uh, sulfur regulation, is that going to drive that 20% greater than that $70 yeah, a barrel? Yeah, so typically the fuel we use for electricity here, the LSFO, the majority of the fuel, petroleum fuel we use for electricity, is typically historically been at a discount to crude, maybe 15 20%. Then you had events like Fukushima, which pressured it above crude. Now... With uh, this new IMO regulation, you're going to have this Fukushima premium permanently, essentially. So it's not going to be a two or three year, you know, I issue. It's going to be until they find an alternative type of fuel, which is going to be very challenging uh, in the near term. So basically, we're going to, if we continue to burn low sulfur fuel oil in the state of Hawaii, we're going to be paying 25, 20 to 25, even maybe more percent higher than the crude oil price at that time. So it's, uh, it's a big deal, especially when 70% of our electricity on this island is generated by this particular fuel that's about to get squeezed. Might make the case for greater renewable energy or maybe even LNG. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, you have uh, a lot of uh, things that people are looking at, basically. Yeah. So you you can also invest in, and, and burn the same stuff and invest in scrubbers, but the guys don't want to do that because maybe the, the IMO says, okay, now we've tackled sulfur, let's tackle the carbon issue. That means you hold, need a whole new fuel. So you put all this sunk cost investment in to tackle the carbon issue, and then it doesn't matter. I mean, the sulfur issue, and now the carbon issue is at play. So they're reluctant to make these added investments to build the scrubbers. So many variables, so, so many, many variables. considerations. But let me, let me ask one last thing, Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> LNG? LNG. So is, there's there a chance for LNG here in Hawaii, Nate? So first to comment on that, it's really kind of fascinating, these trade-offs. So when the governor, uh, when Governor Ige made the decision that he thought it was inappropriate for us to import LNG for the power sector, he extended the life of the refineries, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had this s sort of quandary of how do we stabilize our conventional fuel base and make sure we don't have price and supply disruptions as we're really going downward on our declining our amount of uh, use of low sulfur fuel oil. Um, and that would have accelerated the pace if you had brought in LNG. You, that would have accelerated, accelerated the, the pace of the demise yeah. of the refinery. So, so they've been put on hiatus. So it's kind of interesting, in one sense, in, you know, the refineries can breathe a little, little easier on that, on that matter. But overall, I do believe it does bear uh, further investigation uh, to look at the costs, uh, you know, looking at the, the notion of a very limited uh, sort of time period that you would explore, you know, a transitional use, yes, essentially, yes. because it does have uh, applications in the vehicular side in a significant way. And I think, as Daryl Young pointed out, you know, we have two issues. One, uh, storage, and I if we accelerate the demise of, trans of, of our uh, refineries, we're going to have to go into, essentially, terminals, and we have to make sure that we have all of the uh, products that we need available, including the new renewable products in LNG as well. So it does require, I think, a careful analysis of what the full impacts of that strategy would be, and, and somebody needs to be enlisted to do that yeah. pretty, pretty quickly. Jeff, can you, uh, can you summarize now that we're out of time? <laughs> <I think we're laughs> what are we learning here today, Jeff? <laughs> that, that there's not enough time with these two gentlemen here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeff Ono, my co-host, uh, Shasha Fesharaki, uh, replacing Daryl Young, who was here for the first half of the show, and Mark Glick, uh, HNEI. Thank you so much, all of you, for this great discussion. I hope we can continue it because, obviously, there are a million balls in the air, yeah, yeah. and we're going to have to evaluate and come together on all of this <laughs> and make it happen. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Mark. Thank you.